So, okay, so thank you all for joining us today. We have an amazing guest on diversity and inclusion, Chacho Valdez. Valdez. So Chacho actually is the principal backstage capital and chief of staff to founder and managing partner, Arlen. So he actually went from helping retail customers in a store, and then he connected on Twitter and worked on some side projects with Arlen and became a full-time role uh, to working at the firm and working towards the mission of growing representation in tech. So his experience with running the day-to-day -day operations of small, medium businesses, business development and sales. He is the proud son of a U.S. immigrant, and Chacho has a very strong desire to highlight diversity, especially amongst the Latinx entrepreneur community. So Chacho actually has been featured in Quartz, Inc., and Business Insider. So Chacho, thank you so much for making the time to come on our show today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, not a problem. So I, I went into a little bit just in terms of your background, but what can you tell us just about um, how you came to this particular path in life. You know, where did you grow up? Where did you go to college? And some of the most influential things that happened to you in terms of delivering to you, delivering you from where you were to where you are right now. Yeah, uh, and how back do you want me to go? Because I can go pretty far back. Because um, it, it's interesting <laughs> the way all these leads together. Um, yeah, definitely. So wherever you'd like to start is fantastic. Okay, so... Um, I grew up in uh, rural Wisconsin, which is kind of in, not in the middle of nowhere U.S., but um, mo some people think it is, especially if they're from the coast. And I <laughs> grew up to a, an, an immigrant dad. And I, growing up, what I knew about business and business building was centered around small businesses. So family farms, mm -hmm. construction companies, mm -hmm. la landscaping companies, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Okay. Um, and when I was thinking about going to college, you know, when you're a child of an immigrant, you're like, okay, I could either be a doctor or a lawyer or engineer to achieve the sort of American dream that um, my dad came from Mexico to the U.S. to try to achieve. And I tried to go to school and study cellular biology and went to school for four and a half years to get that degree. And about halfway through school then, I was like, I don't know if this is really what I want to do with my life, but I kind of just kept pushing towards it regardless. And um, mm -hmm. then it became more and more apparent to me that uh, I wanted to be in business. And so I uh, started thinking about, okay, well, what can I do in the business world versus going to medical school? And I actually ended up mm -hmm. um, dropping out of school and um, trying to piece my life back together. I knew I wasn't gonna go to medical school and I um, transferred to a school in Michigan where I could finish my degree online. And while I was finishing my degree online, I would work in different sales roles, different business development roles and ops roles at small companies and eventually landed at a, a role in um, Auburn Hills, Michigan uh, at a Sprint store. And when I joined the store, they were just looking for someone bilingual and I speak OK Spanish. <laughs> and so I, I was hired right away, which was great. And my thought process was I could work in a retail setting, interact with a lot of customers and develop experience around customer support, customer success, sales, all, all of the, those types of things and communication and while finishing my degree. And um, around that same time, I read this uh, report done by Stanford called the Stanford State of Latino Entrepreneurship in the US. And oh in God. the report, um, I that's where I learned about the disparity of funding going towards Latinx founders in particular, but that's sort of what set me down my journey of learning more about just underrepresentation in tech for um, minority entrepreneurs. And I started digging deeper and deeper into that and um, realized that it's really a life calling for me to invest in underrepresented founders. And so mm -hmm. um, during my free time at Sprint, I would uh, be on Twitter interacting with founders and VCs. And that's how I came across Arlen, like you mentioned in the bio. Mm -hmm. And uh, interacted with her, asked her for some book recommendations. 
and try to add value where I could. I um, would send her articles that I thought she might find interesting. I would reply to some of her tweets about the NBA finals, just like anything <laughs> to, to be in the conversation. <laughs> and um, yeah. over time that, that turned into a, a part-time role, which was actually four years ago this month. And then um, wow. later that year- Congratulations, I, nice. Thanks, appreciate it, yes. Um, Later that year, it turned into a full-time role. I, I was really fed up with my uh, retail job at, at Sprint and um, just decided to one day quit without really knowing what the future was for Backstage. And I texted Arlen the next day mm -hmm. and I'm like, hey, I, I quit my job at Sprint. I want to dedicate my full time to Backstage. And she's nice. like, oh, wow, that's really serendipitous because we want to bring you on full time. But what we're doing is really risky. And, um, you know, we don't want to have you leave a job with health benefits and a 401k and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And since then, it's sort of been off to the races. Very interesting. And I also found out that at that time as well, uh, your wife was also thinking about quitting her job. So when I found that out, how important was it for you that she was actually super supportive given the fact that you're both in sort of a precarious position that she kind of encouraged you to to go forward and move forward with what you wanted to do yeah thanks for bringing that up um we uh it was a really difficult decision i think at the but at the same time it wasn't i don't know my wife was quitting her job due to um uh, yeah. chronic lyme disease and so um she had been a oh, school no. teacher for um four years or so four or five years and it got to the point where she needed to stop working for health reasons and um yeah it was, it was like i think that was a really difficult decision because she had gone to school for for that it was like her life dream to be a school teacher um but yeah. she really needed to focus on on um, getting her health back and wow. the, the conversation with us to for me to quit my job was kind of just yeah, I just, I was, um, it was just a phone call while I was at work. <laughs> I was stepped outside the building. And like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And she was really supportive and let me know like, hey, you do what you have to do. We'll figure it out. And, um, and so it, it was like um, a leap of faith for the both of us. But I think we both knew that it, it was like, um, yeah, I, sometimes we talk about it and we're like, what were we thinking? Because <laughs> we had like no money whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, I figured yeah. I could dedicate at least like four weeks to backstage without needing to figure out another job. And yeah. uh, and so um, I thought that was enough time and, and it worked out. Yeah, that's awesome. So take me back to when you were first contacting Arlen, because a lot of people that listen, a lot of people that are going to be watching uh, sort of fear and have trepidation around taking that first imperfect step in towards following what their goals and what their dreams are. So kind of walk us back a little bit on uh, your shoes in terms of like, what gave you that sense of courage to kind of reach out to someone like Arlen, um, you know, with, uh, you know, or quest to initiate that type of relationship? What was it that kind of pushed you to that level? Yeah, so I think I had... I kind of have always been the type of person to sort of shoot my shot in a sense where like um, I remember when I um, wanted to go to medical school, I just walked into a doctor's office that was like a plastic surgeon and like, hey, I'm, I'm the student here. I would love to shadow you. Mm. Would you mind if I shadowed you? He's like, oh, wow. oh yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> you can come shadow. And um, I would just do different things like that even yeah. before. Um, but the um at the same time i was all i've never been i've always struggled with sort of this imposter syndrome of like not feeling like i belong um and yeah. so i think just putting yourself out there and the thing the phrase that i would say to myself is like the worst that someone can do is not respond or say no like if you reach out to a guest mm -hmm. for a podcast like the worst they can do is say no like maybe they could be mean about it that's and that's exactly hurt your feelings right. <laughs> but like at the same time like that's the worst that could happen 
And then I also tried to um, find a way to add value where I could and then not be mm -hmm. uh, come come across as hungry, but not thirsty. I think um, nice. sometimes folks, a, that's a huge difference. I, I really like that. Hungry, not thirsty. Yeah. Um, and that's something Arlen has said. Um, and uh, there's, um, you know, people can people are very intuitive and you can um, understand sort of uh, the place that they're coming from. And sometimes if you're coming from a place of being thirsty or being almost like desperate, the other person can read that, read that and it can be a turnoff. And um, mm -hmm. like just not just because you get in touch with a single person, it's not like that's um, it's not like it can change your life. I'm not saying it can't. I think me reaching out to Arlen yeah. changed my life. But at the same time, I have had to do a lot of work to put myself in that position and then also a lot of work after Arlen gave me an opportunity to make sure I keep the opportunity. Um, and yeah, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it comes around for for me for that mindset of like um, it's like that sales mindset where you know you you get you knock on a hundred doors to get one yes. So that means you're gonna hear no ninety nine times. And it's never fun to hear no. It's never fun <laughs> for people not to respond. Um, but you can certainly put yourself in a position to be at the right place at the right time. And I've tried to do that throughout um, my career so far. Yeah, and I think that's amazing. And I think this interview actually is a testament to that fact. So you're not only just, you know, uh, advocating that, but you're also living by it. Because, you know, I reached out to your organization and then you were responsive in terms of coming on. So that's something that is definitely appreciated. So as far as Backstage Capital, what is your thesis? Uh, what would you say your thesis is uh, with that organization? Yeah, so Backstage Capital is a um, venture capital firm where we invest in pre-seed and seed stage companies. So when people are just getting started or just getting their first few customers or revenue, and we invest exclusively in underrepresented founders. And the mm -hmm. way we define underrepresented are women, people of color, and LGBTQ founders. And mm -hmm. um, like nine, 90 plus percent of funding goes towards white men in the US, uh, what venture capital funding, yeah. when it's not representative of the actual demographic demographics in the US. And so um, we know there are plenty of underrepresented founders starting amazing venture backable businesses. And we think that, um, yes, it's a good thing to do. Yes, it we have, um, we're sort of um, impact investors by default, but we're also investing in an untapped market even still mm -hmm. even 2021 people underrepresent underestimate the underrepresented founders and so um it, that's really important to us too is that it's we're very much um in it for to make money and to make impact yeah i think those two are extremely important so just with regards to that can you sort of walk us through uh, the challenges some of the challenges that you face at backstage capital uh, I think it's just, <laughs> I think it's a challenge to like, just exist every day. Honestly, I think, um, yeah, like, um, last year, uh, or in the past few years, we've really been trying to figure out, you know, raising a larger fund or, um, uh, figure out a good business model for a fund. And it wasn't until this year when we were mm -hmm. able to raise, um, a reg CF through Republic that we've been able to have operational mm. capital to really build out an institutional firm. And so that's what we're working on right now. Um, and so I think like the challenge is, is a lot of like just the macroeconomic type of, um, maybe that's not the right term, just like the, um, like the overall ecosystem and the overall sentiment still towards underrepresented founders. You know, you have, VCs right now who are super super gung ho. And, about and just with that, uh, I'll just finish this thought. You have VCs who are very very gung ho on Miami right now, which is great, and I love that. And um, Miami is a great place and has a great tech ecosystem. But like, you you see VCs who become gung ho about Miami overnight, but then like we've been talking about underrepresented founders for years, and it's like crickets almost. Even still, even now. 
Yeah, I mean, and there's certainly been change, especially since I've, <clears throat> excuse me, joined the firm. Um, but, you know, it's still it's still difficult and it's still um, there's still a lot of work to be done. But I, I think uh, if I wasn't seeing change and if I didn't think it was going to change and I wasn't optimistic about the future, I would be pretty. Um, I don't know if I could do this because it's too difficult otherwise. <laughs> Well, I think that's one of the things that makes the work that you do. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's one of the things that you guys do that makes your work so impactful is the fact that you are, you know, you're doing good. And at the same time, you're really helping others, you know, uh, accelerate and lift themselves up. And these are all individuals who are qualified to run companies. Obviously, you have a vetting process. So it's not like you're putting up people that don't deserve the attention or the support, financial support. It's just the that tradition in a past interview that you know when you're discussing something that has no application practical application in let's say in another demographic person's life then they really don't see maybe the market or the use for that particular uh, item or that particular service or product so I think the work that you do the work that Harlem Capital is doing as well I think it is extremely important now with that I heard you say something interesting on, on the what you actually like to do is establish a relationship with founders before actually moving forward and establishing more of a, uh, I guess, a formal relationship. So can you just kind of tell us a little bit about what the thinking process is behind establishing a relationship with that particular founder in the beginning and then sort of watching them grow their company or their idea? Yeah, I think the I try to take as a human approach to venture capital as I can. And with that comes mm -hmm. with with like getting to know the founder as a person and, you know, what they enjoy doing, what makes them tick, what um, mm -hmm. what they might not be good at, where they might need help. And <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, it's not uncommon for me to ask in a in a um, in a meeting with the founder for the first time, like, what do you like to do for fun outside of work? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that leads to a conversation where it's not just about your business. Like we're talking about you and we're talking about something mm -hmm. you enjoy doing. And so um, it, it, it's like, um, and I actually enjoy learning like, okay, what do they like to do? Do they enjoy running? Do they enjoy golfing? Do they enjoy um, hiking or, or do they enjoy watching movies? I've, you know, I've mountain biking. There's a lot of different things that I hear from founders. Um, and I think um, part of the strategy behind that is if we're going to invest in your company, we're in it for the long haul. We're in it for, you know, a yeah. three, five, seven, ten year. And sometimes I, mean, I think Roblox just went public after like 17 years. That's a long time. And so uh, I want to establish <laughs> like a relationship with founders um early on so that way when things do get difficult and when things um like inevitably like get hard they were one of the first people that they think of to call because then they understand like oh chacho at backstage really cares about me as a person he's mm -hmm. vested in like my yeah. interest and like what or, like in me holistically and so i'm going to feel more comfortable coming to him with uh, an issue that we might be having and um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, that gives us as a firm the opportunity to help that founder through that. And so um, that's sort of the thought process I have. And it's just like it's a more pleasant way for me to like conduct meetings, I think. Um, and it definitely also <laughs> like uh, it separates it, it like really makes you stand out in the founder's eyes as well. Yeah, that, and I think that's that's very keen. Speaking about that, you're also doing something very, very interesting with your accelerator. So just tell us a little bit about it and, you know, why is it so important and what, what are some of the things you want to accomplish with your accelerators? Yeah, so in um, 20, we had the goal of investing in 100 companies by 2020, and we reached that goal in 2018. And so um, when we were thinking about yeah. what we next, yeah, that was an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> um, so when we were thinking about, uh, thank you, yeah. thanks. Um, when we were thinking about what to do next, uh, we we sort of felt this market pull to start an accelerator, and so 
We launched an accelerator in 2019 in four different cities in Los Angeles, Detroit, Philadelphia, and London, and invested in 24 companies out of that accelerator. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was it was a great experience. We had nearly 2,000 applications for those 24 spots, um, and it was a really like competitive um, competitive to get in and. Um, I guess that the, it went great. And I think the biggest learning out of the accelerator is that it's a really difficult business model to pull off. And so um, we didn't we didn't bring it back for a second year. And um, we we it's still something that we can bring back, but we just don't know when or, or when we might do that um, just because it's like a, it, it's really um, difficult to pull off, honestly, especially in four cities globally. Yes. Yeah, and what you do too is create these different ec- ecosystems, as you're saying, in, in other places outside of the valley. Um, so why is that extremely important to uh, to backstage capital to have all these different areas that you can actually develop? Because I understand that you even work on a virtual team. You're not all essentially in the same area that you're you know sort of spread out. So you have a really good feel in terms of what the local uh, business culture is like. So why is it so important to backstage to have this uh, ecosystem? And then how do you see that moving forward into the future? Yeah, I think since I remember since backstage, since I joined backstage, I remember Arlen saying, you know, we invest in about 2% of the companies that we see, but then we want to add as much value as, as we can to the other 98% of companies. And that sort of like ecosystem, mm. a community mm-hmm. approach has been really important because um, sure, like we we're, we want to invest in companies and, and we're trying, we, you know, we're seeking returns and all that stuff, but we're also like doing a lot more beyond that to try to like seed an entire ecosystem and inspire a new group, a new wave of founders to start companies and build tech companies, whether they're venture backed or not. And so, um, we also all come from different parts of the U.S. Like I mentioned, I'm from Wisconsin. Brittany on the team is from um, North Carolina, and she lives um, on the East Coast. And then Christy and Brittany are on the West, or Christy and Arlen are on the West Coast. Um, and so it's been really important for us to think about, yes, we want um, sort of this uh, ethnic diversity and racial diversity and on our team, but we also want demographic diversity and mm-hmm. there's there's diversity beyond sort of just the um what some you know someone's race um or ethnic background mm-hmm. and so um yeah. and we think and we see um great people great founders building companies all across the u.s and so i think it's it kind of goes back to our 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 way of viewing you know the ecosystem of trying to find mm-hmm. Um, great opportunities where other investors aren't looking. And so, um, and especially, you know, and we knew we were, we were going to have an ever increasingly virtual world. And so we were j- just fine investing in companies that we just met over Zoom. And like that proved yeah. out to be really great. And investors really had a, um, a steep learning curve last year when they had to do things through Zoom with the pandemic. And so, um, Zoom. yeah, so uh, we've, um, we tried to um, just trust our gut and follow our gut with a lot of these things, and, and they proved out to be right so far. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And one of the things, too, that I get the impression with, uh, as far as your team is concerned, is that there seems to be, among all of you, a deep sense of empathy for the people that you're working with and the people that you're affecting. So I'm just wondering, um, how important is empathy to to backstage capital, not only in terms of the business decisions that you're making, but also the partnerships that you're establishing with different uh, organizations. Yeah, I think it's um, just very important, of course, and it's something that everyone on the investment team and everyone on the team at Backstage is inherently empathetic and um, very sort of like emotionally intelligent human beings. And um, you know, in a world where so many VCs can seem sort of like out of touch and out of reach and also like um, unrelatable, 
it's where that like empathy comes in where you where pe founders and different people in the ecosystem are like oh yeah like i'm like that too or that's me as well and um and so it's yeah. it's really important and i think um I, I don't think I would be here today if it wasn't for empathy um, and um, the ability to put ourselves in the positions of founders and the positions of early stage employees and the positions of different players in the ecosystem and understand like it, it all has to work together in order to thrive. And so, um, yeah, that, that's that, absolutely quintessential. So, yeah, it, that's very, very key. Um, and so what is it about you know, working with fans because that inspires you all at uh, Backstage Capital. Sorry, I, I um, you cut out for a second there. What What is it that inspires me to work at Backstage? Oh, yeah, no, I was just saying that what is it about um, working with uh, uh, founders, entrepreneurs, really inspires you at Backstage Capital? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so excuse me, the, the biggest thing that, it, you know, with founders is that they're building the future. And so they have insights yes. into market opportunities and into um, product development, into new ways to solve problems that we don't. And so I think mm -hmm. that's the most exciting thing for me and most exciting thing for us is like, we believe the future is diverse. And um, we also believe that um, founders are building the future. And so mm -hmm. um, I think it, my job is to um, learn from the founders and sort of have me paint, have uh, learn and learn from the vision that they're trying to paint for me. And it's not my job necessarily to come into a meeting and to try to sound smart and to try to like, like really like kind of like take you out at the knees for building your startup, I think, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's like um, we're I, we're trying to evaluate this as a potential investment opportunity, and and so um, I think I heard Olin Douglas say this from um, Motley Fool Ventures. He said, "Just because it's a no from us doesn't mean it's a no from the world," and I, that really really resonated mm. with me because wow. like. Mm -hmm. We see so many incredible founders, and we have to say no to so many of them, and just like. I'm like, okay, we have to say no, but there's a lot of different reasons. And, um, but that doesn't mean like you should like stop or you should not do what you're doing. And most founders don't like they understand and they, they keep moving and they're not going to let just one yeah. person's no deter them from, from their journey. And so, but yeah, the, the most exciting thing for me working with founders is just them building the future. And then also underrepresented founders in general are, do have that more human approach i think just because they have have had um uh almost like a more difficult they've had more difficulty launching their companies in, in different ways and so um and then um i'm also just like very optimistic about like the up and coming gen z founders as well because they inherently understand a lot of these human characteristics and a lot of these the importance of diversity and inclusion inherently um and so that that's really exciting for me and they also like very much so values-based consumers millennials are to an extent as well but i really see that in the gen z generation yeah i think so as well so earlier you mentioned that you do see a lot of companies so i'm just wondering because uh the i believe you had 1800 applications last year as far as um you know, relationship building and 24 spots to fill, uh, as you said. So you have a limited amount of spaces to fill that you can actually work with companies. So I'm just wondering, what is the process in terms of vetting companies? What type of things are you looking for uh, that signal to you that this is a company founders that we really want to work with and move forward? Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of different things. And I think, um, and you hear other investors say that it's a lot more art than science. And I, I believe that is true. And mm -hmm. so um, you're trying to understand the founder's background. How did they get to this point? What did mm -hmm. they do have to do to get to this point? What obstacles did they, mm -hmm. did they face and have they faced in their life? Um, mm -hmm. And then also, okay, they're solving a specific problem. 
all these founders are brilliant. And so like, why are they specifically mm -hmm. working on this problem? Um, they can be doing so many things. Mm -hmm. So why this? So understanding why, and um, we're, we seem to be attracted to founders who are solving a pain point that they themselves have experienced, or at least have a very unique insight into that pain point. And so having mm -hmm. sort of that unique market insight and then um, we're also trying to understand different market dynamics, like how many of this type of company have we seen? How, um, why why is like now the right time to invest in this company? And like, why is this the founding team to invest in to solve this specific problem? And then um, we also sort of like have this, um, we try to evaluate their, almost like their grit as well. Like how gritty do we believe this founder is? Um, and so, those are all different types of things, um, including many others that we sort of are asking ourselves. And so, um, but there's not like one, there's not a very specific like metric, like if you hit X number of customers or X number of users, then we're really excited. It's, it's more about like, what has the founder done? What do they understand about the market? Um, and, um, and I think too, like, um, it's just very clear when a founder truly understands like their pain point, and isn't just mm -hmm. like starting a company just to start a company and try to raise a few million bucks. Yeah, well, I think that's very, very key. And um, one of the things that you said that really interested me as well is the fact that, um, you know, you're also looking for founders that have moved forward with their idea. And one of the things that you said that was interesting to me is that a company doesn't necessarily necessarily have to have like a lot of customers or sales or anything like that. I think you mentioned if they had spoken to a lot of people and sort of gotten a really good idea in terms of what the market wants. That's also an attribute that you look at, which I found to be very surprising because with the VC world and it's a type of image that get you know, you need to be a vetted company. You need to have all these really established relationships. You need to have you know, what was it about that particular idea of just encouraging entrepreneurs and, and people seeking support to actually go out into the marketplace and to have not feel that type of pressure? Now I'm going to a VC. I need to have all these things, you know, checkboxed uh, in order to even have a conversation. And with that said, how many of those companies have you seen that have talked to a lot of, of, of people within their market that had a really good at? idea in terms of what they needed have you actually funded um with your relationship with backstage capital yeah so i think um there's um it, it's all it all kind of points to like like i mentioned what have they done in order to get into the room um and so um i think about a founder that we met during office hours and she drove from sacramento to the bay it was like maybe I don't know how long of a drive it is, at least two hours, maybe. Wow. She brought yeah. her kids. She came into the Whoa. room. She only met with us for like 30 minutes um, and she had her kid with her the entire time. And then she like left and went back. And I think about okay, like, wow, that founder did a, a whole lot to just like get into the room. And so that really, like, yes. really impressed me. And so um, different like that's just like one example um but i think um you're able to show that you're just kind of like doing the work towards your idea we're meeting companies at all different stages of that company's life and each company is it's so different and so um we might just meet be meeting with the founder who has their first few beta testers or first few customers um but like what we don't want is to meet come to a founder and they're like tell us some version of a story that's like, I have this great idea. This is like, they have it all written out sort of like on paper. And then they're like, but I need money in order to go get started. And it's like, no, 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 you oh. have it all wrong. Like oh. the money is not the impetus <laughs> for you to getting started. Like you are getting, like the best founders get started whether they have the money or not. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, um, there's so many you can so many things you can do in terms of like um, surveying people, talking to potential customers. Even if you said like, "Hey, I have I talked to a hundred potential customers, and here's what they said. Here's the feedback I got from them. Here's how like wh how I think about their feedback, and this is how I'm going to implement it into our product and into our like overall experience." 
like that's really impressive. And and so um, versus a founder who's like, hey, this is I have this idea, but I need the money in order to get started. And sure, like there's um, different circumstances where like that might be the case, like maybe they have a full time job or, or whatnot. But um, I think as long as you're showing that you're putting in the work and the effort towards building your company, that's really what we're looking for and really what like what I mean by that. Um, and so there's there's a lot more that you can do than just like um, like even when I think about Arlen before she even raised a penny she was doing so much she was learning everything she could about venture she had flashcards she was um, emailing people she was asking for internships you know she was just really really hustling in the true sense of the term and so um, that was before she had a single penny. And so I think yeah. uh, that really sh like shows um, like the grit of a founder, the grit of Arlen and sort of like her endurance for this particular company that she was trying to build and backstage. And um, that's sort of like something, that's something similar I'm trying to look for in founders as well. Yeah, and it's interesting because I was like, uh actually just going to bring her up as well uh, with regards to self-education so with that said you know somebody that's beginning their journey right now in terms of learning a little bit more about uh, the sea world what books would you recommend that they pick up or what books have been impactful in your life in terms of illuminating certain aspects of the vc world yeah <clears throat> excuse me um in terms of books i um, Venture Deals by Brad Feld is really um, the one book that uh, really sort of illuminated um, venture for me in the sense of like, um, just like learning more. It's, um, and when I first read it, it was like completely over my head. I had no idea what all these terms and term sheets are and all this stuff. And then, um, but I think even before that, it was actually um, listening to podcasts. It was listening to um uh, Chris Saka on Jason Calacanis's podcast. And I remember driving mm -hmm. from um, Wisconsin to Michigan to um, visit my girlfriend and now wife. And I would listen to podcasts the entire way. And I remember um, it, listening to, it was like a two-part podcast, maybe two, two and a half hours long, and just being like completely mm -hmm. like enthralled with the conversation. And um, like that was part of like um, what helped me like learn more about venture is listening to different podcasts like that. And um, I, I, I learned a lot through audio. And so um, I learned through reading as well, but I'm a bit of a slower reader. And so audio is a, helps me a little bit more get through books. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, uh, uh, venture deals. There's also a book called The Business of Venture Capital, although albeit it's pretty expensive. Um, and then um, there is the 20 Minute VC podcast, which I really like. There's the um, Invest Like the Best podcast that I really like. Okay. Um, and then Arlen's podcast, Your Your First Million is great as well. And then other podcasts that just feature founder stories um, uh, or um, founder journey. I just listened to a few episodes of um, of like Sequo of, on Sequoia on the Acquired podcast. So usually what I'll do is I just like find a topic I'm interested in, either a firm or a person or a specific um, topic, like I mentioned, and just try to listen to as many things on that specific subject that I can. Um, and that's kind of my been my approach to learning so far. Yeah, no, podcasts are fantastic. And I think we have such an an amazing can listen to podcasts and we can access different pieces of content very very e easily um you know with that said arlen said something very interesting uh along the lines of she doesn't see backstage capital in terms of operating in quarters but in terms of decades uh, so with that said i'm just wondering what your thoughts are what the next decade is going to look like for backstage capital Sure. So I think we you will continue to see us have more and more assets under management, maybe even have like a growth fund. And then um, we will also can start to see like um, exits from our founders. And so I think that that'll be incredible as well. And so I think 
backstage, we will continue to grow. It's sort of like I mentioned, our assets under management and become a little bit more of an institutional type mm-hmm. firm. Um, but also, but always sort of have this touch point with the ecosystem, especially pre-seed founders, because we really believe like mm-hmm. that that's really where a lot of the founders need um, need some help, and we need to continue to seed that ecosystem. Um, and so, um, but yeah, I think, man, in ten years, that's it's so long. But I um, I think about that I've been at backstage for four years now. It just feels like a blur. <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, you'll continue to also <laughs> see a lot of innovative things from backstage that are completely different from what you see at traditional venture funds. And so um, I don't even know what that means, what that what's in store for that. But I think um, Arlen is truly an incredible visionary. And so um, I, I think yeah. like she'll will come up with some great stuff. Yeah, and it's interesting because I saw something else, too, where there's sort of this back and forth inside joke between you guys where um, you kind of go back at her and say that you're eventually going to be taking over the company and she sort of <laughs> she sort of humors you and stuff. So it's, it's very interesting. The dynamic that you guys have, you know, I saw that yes. clip with Gary Vee and I was thinking, these guys actually have fun together. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so, we tried. I try to keep yeah, her so on her toes. She said, yeah, my mom's going to be driving. <laughs> <Get away. laughs> Absolutely. I try to keep our... <laughs> What's interesting? Go, go oh, ahead. No, no, go for it. Oh no! I was just gonna say that it's it's interesting because you know you you rarely see that type of dynamic where there's sort of this really interesting give and take, and uh, it's all based on humor, obviously. And you can tell that you guys have a very good rapport. But you know, it, yeah, it seems like a very um, supportive environment to work in. And I love the fact that Arlen, as successful as she is, can still have these inside jokes with the people that she's working with. So. Yeah, we um now as far as uh, yeah, that's a joke oh. that I say all um all the time, and I'll give you one quick uh, story there just because it's funny. We were in a team meeting, and um, she was going, uh, she had a presentation that she was going to do for the entire team, and we were this was in person yeah. pre COVID, and something started happening with the lights or the um the projector. I can't remember. And they were trying to fix it. And she was like, just about to start this presentation. And then this, they had this issue come up and I shot her a text and I said, it's all <laughs> part of the plan. And then she just started bursting out <laughs> laughing. <laughs> so yes, um, it's it's like, um, it's just, it's a fun joke that, and, um, that we uh, have back and forth. And um, it's something that, yeah, we try not to take ourselves too seriously. Yeah, and I think it's, it's it's amazing. And one of the things too that's really interesting that you guys are doing is the uh, backstage crowd. So I think that's something definitely very very innovative in terms of getting people that aren't accredited to actually be in to invest. I think the minimum is a hundred dollars. So if you could just, you know tell us a bit more about that and why something like that is so important, you know, to our society. Absolutely. So. Um... We launched Backstage Crowd last year um, after the uh, murder of George Floyd because we had so many yeah. people who were like, what can we do to help to support underrepresented founders? And we're like, well, one of the ways you can do that is by actually investing money in underrepresented founders. And so um, we started the, uh, a syndicate um, called Backstage Crowd where we have both accredited and non-accredited investors join. And so we have deals um, that go through the syndicate that are just for accredited investors per SEC regulations. And then we also have deals that we that go through um, crowd that are for everybody and anyone who can invest. And so um, I think it's important for us to um, not just cater towards um, those who are already well off, who are uh, accredited investors, but also to um, cater to um, quote unquote retail investors who are eager to learn, who are maybe just as savvy themselves as other in- investors, and very a lot of them actually are, and um, give them an opportunity to invest in companies um, that are um, raising via Regulation CF, regu- Regulation Crowd Fund. Um, and uh, we've had uh, several of our companies raise um, through a, a Reg CF. And so um, 
it's a good opportunity for them to participate in investing and also to learn. And I think um, if I think about myself four years ago, like I would have done anything I could to invest a hundred dollars into some companies. And um, yeah, really. one of my first investments into a company was through one of my friends, uh, Harold at Bandwagon. Um, he gave me a hundred dollars to invest in his company because I didn't have a hundred bucks <laughs> at the time. And so like, it was a very, like, that was my first like quote unquote angel investment, but it's very significant. And um, I'm not accredited yet, but I, I, I hope to be in the future. But, um, you know, I can say mm -hmm. I'm an angel investor, I guess, because I've invested in his company. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, it's important for us to um, not only invest in companies, but also to teach other people about how we do things and help them so that they can do it themselves and so that they can um, and, yeah, learn along the way. Yeah, I think that education piece is extremely important. Um, and with that said, you know, we do learn a lot just in terms of how to invest in things like that, that we cobble together either through self-education or, or sometimes. But I'm wondering what's really fundamental is actually implementing something like this in the educational system. So, you know, if it were up to you, education um, council or, or the government, the Department of Education came to you and said that, you know, we have this mandate now to include investing uh, or to teach investing principles to younger the younger generation what are some of the key things that you'd want to implement in a curriculum to do that wow yeah that's a good question i think um i haven't thought about it so i'm just going off of like um the top of my head but i think um i would give them an understanding of just um like microeconomics and have like a clear base when it comes to microeconomics mm -hmm. um i might even like teach like the basics of like accounting like a p l type of thing and then um and then also just teach them about building credit about um saving money about down house down payments mortgages mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and then um teaching them you know about com compounding interest about all the different sort of investment vehicles and so um when it comes to like public public equities um and so I think it would be a lot more just like understanding the basics, the time value of money, all these di different things that um, are really I, I didn't learn about in school. Um, yeah. And um, I had to learn through like self-education. And, and so um, I think those things, those types of lessons are really important. Um, and there's a lot. The great thing is that there's a lot of tools out there today um, for, for kids to learn. Um, and so um, we have a company called Goals, Goal Setter that helps kids save towards different things that they want to buy, but also to set up, set up savings accounts, um, put money into some investment vehicles, and really just learn about money in general. And so um, it's really important, though. And something like I even think about myself, like I had no idea the importance of credit until I was maybe 24, 25 years old. And by that time, you know, I, I could have been building my credit since I was 18 years old and which would have been put me in a great position, you know, by the age of 25. And and so there's um, and um, versus like my wife, whose dad taught her about credit and building your credit when she was like 16. And it's just a matter of like education. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's a long winded answer to your question, but a, a lot of just like the basic fundamentals fundamentals around finance and um, microeconomics. Yeah, that's those are all those points that you brought up are extremely important. So I just have a couple of more questions for you. So one of them is that um, Arlen on uh, another podcast had mentioned that um, in her book, It's About Damn Time, which is fantastic. Everyone should definitely go out and get it. She mentioned the idea of not wanting to write a memoir where she quote unquote made it. And it kind of struck me because she's someone that extremely successful given the trajectory of where her life has has taken her. So I'm wondering how much of that sort of hunger permeates the culture of backstage capital where 
none of you think that you've actually made it or, or made that amazing deal, but there's always sort of this hunger of finding the next entrepreneur, the next idea that can change the world. How prevalent is that in, in Backstage Capital in terms of the culture? Yeah, I think it's pretty prevalent uh, throughout. Um, I think, you know, any company culture is sort of an extension of the founder. And so yeah. um, that's a really keen insight that you have. And it's like, um, it's a, it's it's like a good and a bad in a way because it's good in the sense of constantly striving and constantly pushing and constantly trying to better yourself. That's that's great. But then in the bad, it can kind of feel like, okay, am I doing enough? I feel like I'm not doing enough. I feel like I could be doing more. And it, some of those things can be true, but there has to be some of like that self-compassion at the same time where you're like, okay, um, like we just raised $5 million. Like that's a big deal. That's huge. That's and that's huge. incredible. Yeah. But then like, but at the same time, we're like, we've like, okay, we've done that. Now it's time to like execute. We're like, we're constantly like on this sort of like execution mode. And so, mm -hmm. um, it's something that um, even just like me personally, like I've talked to my therapist about even just on Monday, <laughs> I was like, I have this like constant push and pull of like wanting to better myself and to constantly improve, but at the same time being down on myself often because I feel as though I'm not never doing enough. And this is a, a struggle I've had mm -hmm. my entire life. And so it's, oh, it's oh, like, oh. at what point, um, at what point is it like unhealthy to, um, and I'm not saying we have an unhealthy culture at Backstage, I'm just talking about me no. personally, but at, like, mm -hmm. at what point in my personal life is it unhealthy for me to be like constantly be like, dude, you need to do better, or, like you're not doing enough or whatever, where like, I know I'm doing a lot, <laughs> you know? And so um, it's just constant push and pull. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys are doing fantastic. Um, and so my last question to you is, um, you know, what, what would you want your legacy to be both at Backstage Capital and as an individual in society? Um, I haven't thought about it too much, to be honest. I've been in so, um, such like, uh, like sort of like doing mode um, ever since, even before Backstage. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, my legacy would just be to um, be a kinder person to like other people and to yourself. Um, and I think to be like very um, present in our in this like day in our, in our daily moments because um, yeah, things can change so quickly in your life, um, whether yeah. someone in your family gets sick or someone passes away. and yeah. like, when those things happen, like all you long for are the presence of that other human being. It's not longing for you to yeah. have like this incredible experience or build this incredible company. It's literally for them to just be sitting there with you in their presence. And so when I think about like my legacy, yeah. I think it's it's just really kind of um, bringing sort of human values to investing and to company building. And to um, to yeah lead with different traits like empathy and emotional intelligence and grit and endurance, um, and so um, uh, more so so often we talk about you know different product market fit hacks or how to raise your first round of funding, but it's like I don't see a lot of things about how do you take care of yourself of yourself as a founder? How do you make sure you don't burn out? How do you mend different like co-founder relationships if they're not going well or how do you manage the expectations mm -hmm. of your employees like so many different like human elements to things um and so yeah i don't know what my legacy will be but i hope it's um it's that a little bit of that yeah those are all fan fantastic I, and it's funny that you talk about that because i think that also you know, when you think about the way that we're educated, we really don't get those classes in um, presence and gratitude and sort of holding a present state of mind and, and uh, empathy, active listening and things of that nature. So I think all of the things that you mentioned 
uh, are extremely important, especially given the fact that entrepreneurs and founders do live very stressful <laughs> existences. Yes. Um, and so it's, it's very good that you know that they become mindful of okay yeah I, I need to take care of me now this time to focus and hone in on on the things that uh, uh, the things that are important to me and sort of the things that actually bring me joy outside of this thing that I've created um, and so very, very last thing I'm going to say a quote and. If you could just tell me the first thing that comes to mind, that would be fantastic. So okay. I, this quote is actually coming from somebody that you know very, very well, uh, someone that you admire. So let's go ahead and say this. What is yours is inherited. It is now yours to claim. Oh, wow. What's the first word that comes to my mind? I think it's my ancestors. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think um, I think <laughs> about just the, yeah, the... Uh, the, my family line when it comes to um, all that they've had to do to build lives for themselves and even get to like m- sort of like my point in the family line where like I'm blessed with the opportunity to do what I do. Um, yeah, that's what I think about. That's awesome. It's not one word, yeah, sorry. Not- <laughs> But it's coming from a very inspirational place, so I think it deserves more than one word. But no, Chacho, thank you so much for for coming on the show. I know that um, you know you are extremely busy, so thank you, appreciate it. Absolutely, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Our pleasure.